Hey guys, good to be with you again. We are picking it up with the story of Chickadee and his brother and how they return. I'm glad to be here. It was neat to touch base with you guys some last week. And I hope that you're catching up fast with what we're reading and that you're going to have a chance to um, listen to the stories, maybe even listen to some of your favorite chapters and then start looking through the PDF we shared, looking at some of those ideas, looking at the research behind this and thinking about what you can do to really dig into this story sort of behind the story into the history. So we're going to start and I hope um, as you follow along you know any words you don't know, any concepts that you're unfamiliar with and hey hit me up on Classroom, Google Classroom. Let me know what you're thinking about, let me know what you don't understand and I'd love to have that conversation. We can follow up on Zoom, follow up on um, Google Classroom, email, whatever you want, and we will learn together. So let's pull up our Kindle and our story. There we go. Chapter 22. We are coming down the home stretch, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter 22, 80% of the way done. Omakaya sat next to her son Makuns, holding his dry hand. He was hot with fever and lay perfectly still. At least the worst of it was over, and he squeezed her hand back from time to time and sipped cool water or Nokomis' medicine. Nokomis was out foraging for more willow bark. Brewed into a tea, the inner bark helped ease the fever. Makuns was slowly improving, but these days it seemed that no sooner did he get over an illness than he succumbed to another one. Zozi, so good at hunting small game and drying meat, was busy boiling a broth of rabbit and beaver meat. She stirred in dried and pounded cattail root to thicken the broth. Then she brought a bowl over to Omakayas. Slowly, she spooned the broth into Makun's mouth. He swallowed carefully, then fell asleep. Even eating seemed to exhaust him. Chickity, my brother, he mumbled in his sleep. Makun smiled. He smiled only in his sleep. Omakaius was sure that those smiles happened only when he was dreaming of playing with Chickadee. Zozi put her hand on her second mother's shoulder. I know he is alive somewhere, said Omakaius. I know it too, said Zozi. I think that I should feel it if my son were gone from this earth, said Omakaius slowly. Inside, she was not so sure. Nobody could understand all that happened on this earth, and Omakaius was not a medicine person yet, not like Nokomis, although her grandmother was teaching her everything she knew. The little cabin was propped up and stabilized now, and the logs were tightly chinked with mud. The floor was tamped down and then covered with rush mats. Everyone took off their moccasins when entering, so the mats stayed nice and clean. Fishtail had traded for a small square stove, and the wood was neatly stacked beside. He and Angeline had roped off small wood, a small room in one corner hung with blankets and made snug. In another corner, Mikwam and Yellow Kettle slept. Omakaius and Anamikins had their part of the room too. Nikomas curled near the stove with Zozi and Makuns, and two strikes slept outside with the horses. Although nine people lived in the tiny cabin and one outside, there was an empty space that could be filled only by Chickadee. Out and back, the seeds that Nokomis had saved so carefully were now sprouting. The corn leaves were sturdy and fresh. The dark potato leaves curled down from their mounds of earth. Tendrils of squash and bean vines had become their, begun their searching climb up the poles Nokomis sank near each plant. Every day, Nokomis, helped by yellow kettle, added to the fence around the garden. Fishtail, Anamikins, and Two Strike worked with the horses. Mikwam was learning how to build a cart. He decided that his canoe building skills were of little use on the prairie, and he'd best learn from the masters of the Red River cart. When he began building the cart using borrow tools, cutting, and working with wood, he amazed his family. This old man is a wonder, said Yellow Kettle proudly. He will not be stopped. He is building us a cart. He is making it so we can join the buffalo hunt, said Two Strike. We will learn the ways of these Mati people and copy their hunting. It is lucky that Babiche and Batiste so kindly gave you their horses, said Fishtail. Kindly, said Two Strike. I'd like to see them kindly try to take them back after stealing our chickadee. Makuns came out the door and she fell silent. 
Two Strike reached out helplessly as Macoons walked by. My boy, she said, her harsh voice unusually low and coaxing. Would you like to ride Brownie or Brownie? They have become gentle, obedient, and love you. Look! She pointed at the horses, who were tossing their heads up and down. To Macoons, it looked like they were agreeing with Two Strike. Actually, they, were, they tossed their heads up and down when they saw Two Strike because she brought them whatever treats she could find. She shared tender plants, sweetened bread, dried berries, and more. The horses believed she was one of them, their leader. When, wherever she walked, they followed. When she stopped, they stopped. They stood behind her, craned over her shoulder, and gently lowered their hard noses and velvet lips to her hands. Macoons looked at them indifferently, but allowed Two Strike to help him into the saddle. Browning flicked her ears to Two Strike and listened to all she said, then began to trot around and around her in an even circle. As Two Strike turned, the horse kept her eye lovingly on the powerful woman. Slowly, Macoons eased into the horse's stride. Soon, he was cantering along with wonderful ease, his hands caught in Brownie's flowing ma mane. Majan! cried Two Strike, sweeping her hands toward the open prairie. Away Brownie loped, Macoons on her back. He actually laughed. He rode the horse into this distance, and then Two Strike whistled. Brownie flicked back an ear and headed home. Two Strike had a piece of jellied bannock waiting. She looked anxiously at Macoons. His eyes looked brighter, but the moment his feet touched ground, his shoulders sagged. If only we could keep him on a horse day and night, he might get better. You could help him, said Two Strike to Brownie, but he is a human. Sometimes he must walk the same earth as his brother. As soon as his feet touch that ground, he is reminded that somewhere, nowhere, anywhere, his brother walks too. Chapter 23 Return of the Booyah After the mosquitoes, the ox cart train made good time on a level piece of prairie and even managed the difficult part of the road that wound in and out of the woods through sloughs and along quaking bogs. There was plenty of fresh game along the trail, and every night the fiddles came out. Antoinette brewed coffee. The Métis liked to celebrate any small thing that happened, as well as big things. Birthdays were big things, and it seemed to Chickadee that everyone, and even the oxen, had parties at night for their special days. The slough began to blend together, and the oxen struggled in the mushy ground. One day, the carts at the beginning of the line made it through a deep slough, but by the time Uncle Quill's cart and then Antoinette's, who was just behind them, got to the swampiest place, it was impossible. Both carts sank their wheels right in and could not budge. Immediately, men from the other carts came to try to extricate the two carts. From firmer ground, they tried to pull the oxen up. From behind, they tried to push, push the carts. They cut great bun bunches of reeds and laid them down under the wheels, but the muck seemed bottomless. In the middle of all the effort, everyone paused to catch a breath. They stood around the stuck carts, pondering at their next move, arguing and thinking up new advice. As they stood there, Chickadee saw two men approaching. They were coming down the road far ahead, but he recognized them anyway. Though tiny, they were also huge. They slouched along, packs slung across their backs, smoking their pipes, gesturing loudly, gesturing, laughing. They wore the same knitted red hats, had the same drum-tight bellies, and their beards stuck out on either side ferociously. Uncle, said Chickadee, pulling on Quill's sleeve, those two men are coming, the two I told you about. Not now, said Quill. He was worried that an axle or wheel might break beneath the strain, or that the cart would sit in the mud until the middle of summer. He was trying to figure a way out. Uncle, said Chickadee more urgently, those are the men who kidnapped me. Aye, ah, said Quill distractedly. Maybe we could cut some popple branches, some popple trees, and make a little bridge to get these oxen out. I saw some trees a few miles back. Remember their names? Bapi, Babiche, and Batiste, they're here. And they were. Chickadee held tightly to his uncle's jacket. He wasn't exactly afraid that Babish and Batiste would steal him again, but he wondered what they were up to. He didn't trust them, and their horses were gone. Where were Brownie and Brownie? Why were they on foot? Sakwaka! bellowed Babish when he saw Chickadee. Our little master! Babish Batiste cried. He survived! The two great brothers plunged through the slough and rose dripping and happy. 
They tried to embrace Chickadee, but Quill now remembered the whole story and stood between them and his nephew. Your little master? Chickadee was more than surprised. I was your servant the last time I saw you. What happened? Ah, said Babiche, my good brother and I had our hearts clarified. We met a great woman, a woman of many knives, a woman stronger than the two of us. Together, we both asked her to marry us. Two strike? You asked her to marry you? Ah, we, oui, said both brothers. She is strong enough away for both of us, said Baptiste. We said that we would serve her until we perished. But she said, serve Chickadee instead. But we didn't know where you were. Oh, God of grace of God, now we have found you. You, our little master. Babiche and Baptiste threw their arms wide. No need, said Chickadee, and introduced his uncle and Antoinette and her grandchildren. He asked what had happened to Brownie and Brownie. We gave them to the great lady. We gave them as wedding gifts, said Babiche. May it still be true that she has them and is considering our request. I'm sure she's thinking about it, said Uncle Quill, but we will never know unless we make it out of this mud. It threatens to suck these carts right down to hell. We would never let that happen, cried Babiche. We will use our endless strength. The two great brothers rubbed their hands together, and their force was combined with the others who strove in the muddy slough. Slowly, with an endless sucking groan, the first ox was pulled free. Then the brothers put their immense arms to work and lifted the cart right out of the mud and carried it to firm ground. They did the same for Antoinette's cart. Mon Dieu, she exclaimed, I have never seen such power. You must need food for your great bellies now. Ah oui, madame, so we do, said the brothers. The carts labored on for some distance until the way looked clear again and they had caught up to the rest of the train. The first carts were already camped, and so Uncle Quill did the same. Antoinette invited the two brothers to camp with her family and to enjoy her cooking. Chickadee heard Babiche say the word Booya, and he sidled over to his uncle. Uncle, have you ever tasted Booya? he asked. Uncle Quill looked down at Chickadee with pity in his eyes. Were you forced to eat Booya? he asked. Yes, my uncle. There is some good booya, said Quill. My wife makes it, and I'll bet Antoinette makes a good batch too. But it can be terrible stuff. Giget, I could not agree more. Get it, boy, said Chickadee. If Antoinette offers us some supper, said Quill, and I know she will, we will smell it first. We will test it just a little. I have found it is always wise to be cautious where booya is considered concerned. That night, the camp rested exhaustedly after the efforts of the day. Passing into slumber, Chickadee heard a pack of wolves howling in the near distance. He could tell that they were howling for joy, and thought they were probably celebrating the young pups as they emerged from their dens. Maybe they had made a kill that day, and all of them felt like singing. Their song went on and on into the night, and Chickadee slept happily, his back against his uncle's buffalo robe. When he woke the next morning, a light rain was lashing down all around the cart. Antoinette had fixed a set of bent willow branches on her cart, and when it rained or the sun became too hot, she fastened her canvas teepee over the poles and traveled in comfort. My boy, said Uncle Quill, we are going to have to do the same. He had bought some canvas in St. Paul, and now he spotted strong new willow growing near. After drinking some tea at Antoinette's camp, he cut the poles and erected the same contraption on his ox cart. Now this is traveling, he said happily to Chickadee as they started out. In spite of the rain, they now continued along a ridge of land that was perfectly solid. It was a pleasure to jounce along. The ox was well fed on new grass and pulled easily. The gentle rain blew around them in warm gusts, but they were dry beneath the canvas. When they talked now, they mainly read each other's lips. With their ears plugged and the appalling creaking of the carts, they couldn't even hear each other yell. But they managed to communicate quite, communicate quite well, even so. Uncle Quill, said Chickadee as they traveled the good road, can you tell me a story about when you were young? Quill laughed. In those days, I was always getting into trouble. That's what Mama says. She's right. One time, I stayed behind on purpose at Wild Rice Camp. Everybody left without me. I was alone in the woods. I know what that's like, said Chickadee. 
It wasn't so bad, said Uncle Quill. Did you meet any spirits? Several times I did. They were Mimi Gwesiwag, little people spirits. Once your mother and I got caught in the rapids. At night! There we were in our canoe, washed right downstream, pushed along quick as an arrow. In the dark, we could see nothing. It's amazing we came out of that alive. But we were protected by the Meme West Gwesiwag, who lived along that stream. I saw one afterward, a hairy little round man. He was smiling at us. He looked proud that we'd lived. I have never seen one of those spirits, said Chickadee. But when I was alone, starving, two hawks had pity on me because I helped them. Also, I have spoken to my own namesake, and the little bird gave advice to me. Ah, said Quill, you are very fortunate. You must remember that advice forever. Did he give you anything else? A song. Quill gave a low whistle. That is a very powerful thing, my boy. To have your namesake, your protector, and a song. You will be able to heal with that song. That's what my way said, told me. Yes, when you are given a song, you must use it for good things. You will help people with that song. Will you sing it for me? Uncle Quill tipped his head very close and Chickadee sang the song into his ear. Quill was quiet for a good bit of the time as the ox cart rolled and bounced over the trail. He hummed the song thoughtfully. Finally, he said it was a good song. Nokomis would say that song will last through time. Chickadee let the pleasure of that thought and the happiness at the thought of seeing his family fill him. Uncle, he said, do you have a story for me? Perhaps something else that happened to you when you were a boy, or perhaps about your naming. Your name Quill is a powerful name. I suppose it was given to you as a young warrior. I suppose that your shot was fine as a quill, or your arrows were always that sharp. I suppose the enemy feared your sharpness. Uncle Quill was silent. After a while, he looked at Chickadee, shook his wild hair, and laughed. One time, he said, I thought I was a great hunter. I saw a porcupine up in a tree. I knocked it out of the tree, and you know what? That baby porcupine, it fell on me. Quills stuck all over in me. There were quills in my arms, quills on my head, quills even on the end of my nose. That is how I got my name. Oh, said Chickadee. He tried not to sound disappointed, but he was surprised. I was always playing tricks on people, always teasing your mother. I wasn't a great hero, you know. Did you save anybody, asked Chickadee? Did you kill a bear as it charged you? No, said Quill. Did a thousand warriors surround you and you terrified them with your war cry? No, said Quill. Did you put out a raging fire? Yes, I did that, Quill remembered happily. I put out a raging fire once. The fire was raging on the seat of my pants. I put it out by dunking my butt in a bucket of water. <sighs> you are so big and strong, said Chickadee, almost desperate now. You must have done something brave. Not yet, said Quill, but I did take care of that little namesake, that porcupine. It lived with me for a year. I didn't eat him even when we nearly starved to death. That's pretty good, said Chickadee. If you want some good hunting stories, you should ask Two Strike. I'd be scared to ask Two Strike, said Chickadee. Did you ever hear about the time Two Strike rode a moose? No, said Chickadee. I'll tell you, said Quill. One day, Two Strike was paddling her canoe on the lake, and there she saw a moose just swimming along in front of her. You know how she always has her knives or her gun for hunting? Always, said Chickadee, who couldn't imagine her otherwise. This time, she'd forgotten everything. Imagine, she'd just gone out to enjoy the day. This, she never did. And here a moose swims right up to her. Of course, she wanted to hunt that moose. Of course, said Chickadee. She only had a rope, said Quill. So she tied that rope around the moose and then jumped out of that boat right onto the moose's back. So there she was, riding on a moose in the lake, just as easy as you please. She steered it by the antlers. Of course, pretty soon the moose wants to get out of the lake, and out he comes. Two Strike is now on top of the moose, riding it like a horse. Do you think the moose likes that? No, said Chickadee. Oh, you can bet it doesn't like that one bit. 
The moose can't see what is on its back, but knows it isn't good. That moose starts running furiously through the woods. It runs under low branches, trying to escape the thing off its back. Two Strike holds on for dear life. If she falls off, that moose will stomp her with its knife-sharp hooves. What happened? After a very long while, the moose starts walking slower and slower. Finally, the moose fell asleep. She tired it out, that Two Strike. That moose was walking in its sleep. Two Strike hopped off, still holding that rope, and the moose kept walking in its sleep. She could lead it anywhere. She led that moose home, back to camp. Really? I saw it! Into camp walks Two Strike with that moose walking right beside her, sleepy and gentle as a puppy. Of course, knowing me, you probably know what I did when I saw her bring that sleeping moose into camp. What did you do? asked Chickadee. I shouted, wake up, said Quill, and boy, did it ever startle awake. That moose looked around, turned its head this way and that, as though thinking, how do I get here? Then it rears up and tears through. Then it rears up and tears through the camp, knocking over the kettles, kicking through the wigwams. It tossed a rack of dried fish into the air. Fish rained down everywhere. It caught a blanket on its antlers, and the blanket hung down over its eyes. That moose was twirling around and around in the middle of the camp, blinded. That rope swung by a two-strike. She caught the end of the rope, but it fell off the moose. She was laughing too hard to kill that moose. It just ran off, the blanket flapping off its head. Later on, we found that blanket on the ground. It was all torn up. I guess that moose tried to fight it, just dumped it to pieces. Oh, we never forgot that. Chickadee laughed, imagining the torn blanket. The trail wound through beautiful woods of tamarack and over corduroy roads that were made of skin tamarack poles placed one together one after the other. The roads were bone rattling, but nobody got stuck. If one of the poles broke, the ox cart train stopped and cut a new pole to replace it. That was part of the way of the trail, Uncle Quill explained. If something on the trail goes wrong, a tree falls across, a pole breaks, then we fix it. We depend on those who went before us to do the same. Once, I explained this to Nokomis. Know what she said? What? She said that was how the world should work. We should fix what we break in this world for the ones who come next, our children. And that's the end of chapter 23. I think we have, well, let's take a quick look here. I don't know if you can see this. We have a total of, oh my goodness, two more chapters. So this is the second to last, or penultimate um, video that we're making reading this book. So two more chapters and then we're wrapped up. I'm going to put it back to you and you guys get to share with me what you've been learning. Share with me your PowerPoints. And once again, you can go to Google Classroom and check that out. Thanks for listening. We'll see you later this week.